as the morning mist parted on November 3rd, 1760, the esteemed Austrian Field Marshal Daun and his commanders gathered for their daily meeting. With bated breath, they awaited news of the infamous Prussian army led by the brilliant Frederick the Great, who was known for his cunning and strategic prowess. Yet, the Austrians had secured an unassailable position, a bastion of tactical advantage that made any frontal assault tantamount to a suicide mission. A battle of wits was about to begin. Suddenly, across the thickly wooded forest, the sound of steel clashing against steel reverberated through the air. Could it be? Could the audacious Prussian king have the temerity to outflank Don's entire position and strike at his rear? Dawn couldn't be sure, but he knew that he couldn't afford to take any chances. He quickly ordered a redeployment of his troops to face the unexpected threat. And so it began, the Battle of Torgau. Both sides fought fiercely, determined to emerge victorious in this epic struggle. And even today, contemporaries and historians alike speak of the brutal intensity of the battle. The victory at the Battle of Liegnitz was a long-awaited triumph for the beleaguered Prussians, who had suffered a string of crushing defeats since the fateful Battle of Hochkirch almost two years prior. Yet, even with this significant win, Frederick remained despondent and uncertain about the ultimate outcome of the war. While hindsight now clearly points to Liegnitz as a pivotal turning point, at the time, the outlook was far from optimistic. Following the battle, a tense stalemate descended upon the region. Both sides, led by Daun and Frederick, were locked in a fierce contest, their armies cautiously maneuvering through the western Silesian hills. Defensive positions were held tenaciously with neither side willing to risk attacking the other lest they abandon their strategic high ground. Meanwhile, on the Western Front, under the leadership of Ferdinand of Brunswick, the situation was less than rosy. The French, suffering significant losses overseas, found themselves weakened when it came to inevitable peace negotiations. In a desperate move, the Duc de Broglie launched a massive campaign against Hessen and Westphalia, amassing an army of 150,000 soldiers. Outnumbered and outmatched, Ferdinand was forced to retreat, despite winning numerous engagements along the way. Amidst the tumultuous conflict, the winds of war shifted once more, with events taking a dramatic turn on the Western Front. On July 31st, Ferdinand scored a resounding victory at Warburg. But the French, with their superior numbers, seized the Hanoverian city of Göttingen just one week later, encroaching further into enemy territory. The stalemate that ensued lasted throughout the year, but Frederick received increasingly alarming reports about the British Parliament's reluctance to continue financing the seemingly endless war. With their objectives already achieved, there seemed little reason to continue this costly and draining conflict. As the year wore on, the situation grew more precarious still. On October 25th, King George II passed away, succeeded by his young 22-year-old grandson, George III, who had little love for Hanover, referring to it as that horrid electorate which has always lived upon the very vitals of this poor country. Frederick knew that generous subsidies from Britain were unlikely to continue flowing as they had in the years before. In the east, the Russian front remained in a lull until the Russians suddenly broke the silence with a bold move. Frederick ordered his brother Henry to keep a 14,000-strong force to watch the Russians, while he himself remained at Glatz with the 50,000-strong main army. However, the French military attaché in the Russian camp launched an energetic diplomatic campaign to convince General Chernyshev to take action. With the Prussians preoccupied in Silesia, Berlin was left virtually undefended. The Russian general conceded, 
and with a formidable 17,000 strong army, he marched on the city, capturing it with ease in the first week of October. Soon, Lacy joined him with 18,000 Austrians and Saxons, turning the tide of the war in a new, dangerous direction. As the Russian invaders descended upon the capital city of Berlin, they were not content with mere victory. Plundering and vandalism ran rampant, with the Charlottenburg and Schönhausen palaces falling prey to their destructive whims. But this was no glorious triumph, for the Russian army suffered its greatest losses during a botched attempt to blow up a powder mill, with 15 soldiers meeting their end. With the knowledge that his victory at Liegnitz had not turned the tides of the war, Frederick knew that he must make a strategic retreat to Saxony in order to defend his electorate and perhaps even relieve Berlin from the clutches of his enemies. With unyielding determination, he began his march from Sagan, unnerving the Russian forces enough to abandon their hold on the capital. Daun, receiving constant directives from Maria Theresa, knew that he could not afford to lose control over Saxony or engage in battle with the king at any cost. In order to increase their chances of victory, he planned to unite with Lacey, who was marching south from Berlin. But Frederick was no fool and rightly anticipated their movements, marching towards the important defensive position of Torgau to intercept them. With his brother Henry keeping a watchful eye on the Russian forces in Poland, Frederick was able to focus his attention on the Austrians and their stronghold in Torgo. The Austrians had taken a strong defensive position, allowing them to remain a credible threat to the entire electorate of Saxony. On November 3rd, the two armies clashed northeast of Leipzig at Torgo, a battle that would determine the course of the war. With both sides fiercely determined to emerge victorious, it was a fight to the death, with no quarter given or taken. The winds of war were howling once again as the Prussian and Austrian armies faced off in a fateful showdown. Torgau, a fortified stronghold on the west bank of the Elbe, would become the crucible for this epic confrontation. The Austrians, confident in their elevated position facing south, had taken a strong defensive stance. With the Elbe, Torgau's walls and treacherous terrain blocking any frontal assault, the Prussians had to find a way to outflank their enemy. Commanding an impressive force of 55,000 soldiers, Daun was a formidable adversary. His army consisted of 42,000 infantry, 10,000 cavalry, and a staggering 220 artillery pieces. Meanwhile, Frederick, leading a force of 48,000, had his work cut out for him. He had 35,000 infantry, 13,000 cavalry, and up to 250 guns at his disposal, but he knew that brute force alone would not carry the day. Frederick was not one to shy away from a bold maneuver. To outflank the Austrians, he devised a daring plan to circumvent their right flank from the west. This would be no easy task, as his army would have to march 12 miles, or roughly 20 kilometers, through treacherous terrain right before the battle. Frederick was aware of the risks, but he knew that the wooded hills would conceal his approach. Nevertheless, Dawn was in an ideal position for observation, and Frederick needed to keep him distracted. To achieve this, he would launch a frontal attack against Dawn's center at Subtitz, hoping to draw the Austrians' attention away from his flanking maneuver. With the majority of his army, 24,000 infantry, 6,500 cavalry, and 50 artillery pieces, Moving to attack the Austrians from the rear, the fate of the battle would hang in the balance. The stage was set, and the battle for Torgau was about to begin. With a smaller army commanded by General Zieten, numbering 11,000 infantry and 7,000 cavalry, Frederick intended to launch a frontal attack to divert the Austrian attention. They started from the southwest, skillfully avoiding the marshy terrain and swamps that could slow them down. Meanwhile, Zethan's army marched around seven miles towards Dawn's south. As the clock struck 6.30 a.m., Frederick's army embarked on their march from Schilder. They positioned their army in three columns, 
with the king himself leading the first column of infantry battalions. The second column of battalions was commanded by General von Hulsen, while Prince Georg von Holstein Gottorp commanded the third column with all his cavalry and some leftover infantry. The ground beneath them shook as they marched forward, ready for battle. The march around Daun's force took longer than expected, and the Austrians caught on to their plan. Scouts quickly spotted an enormous army passing their western flank, sending them into a frenzy. Minor skirmishes with pickets revealed their movement, and Daun redeployed his army, sending his second line to defend his north. Meanwhile, Zieten came under heavy fire from the Austrian positions, unable to attack just yet. By 1 p.m., Frederick reached his intended position to attack, but there was no surprise. His artillery and Holsen's column lagged far behind due to the rough terrain, and Holstein's cavalry was nowhere to be seen. Despite the unfavorable conditions, the king decided to launch the first attack by 2 p.m., prompted by the sound of cannon fire in the distance. As artillery on both sides opened fire, the first 10 infantry battalions attacked with fierce determination. However, the Austrian artillery was merciless, tearing through Prussian lines with ease. Before every soldier discharged their musket, the vanguard reportedly already suffered over half their strength in casualties, staggering back to their lines. But the Prussian soldiers were not about to give up. When a small vanguard of the Austrian infantry attacked, the second Prussian infantry line barely managed to stop them. Holson's battalions finally arrived on the battlefield and deployed, quickly turning the tide of the battle. The Austrian infantry was bested, and the Prussians advanced, inching closer to victory. Before they could fall on the Austrians, some faced a cavalry counterattack, personally led by Dorn. The battle was savage, and fighting took place along the entire line. Amidst the chaos, a lost musket ball hit Frederick, causing him to briefly slip out of consciousness and be carried from the battlefield. In total, three horses had been shot from under him. As he regained consciousness, the king could see his second attack fail. 26 battalions were shot to pieces, and the Austrians destroyed large parts of his artillery. Despite the setback, Frederick remained resolute, knowing that the war was far from over. At last, the Prussian cavalry arrived, their horses thundering through the battlefield as they took their positions. The wounded Frederick himself commanded Holstein to charge from the far left, while what remained of the infantry banded together for a third assault to relieve their exhausted comrades. The Prussian cavalry galloped towards the front lines, arriving just in time to join the fray, the sound of their hooves echoing across the battlefield as the clock struck 3.30 p.m. As dusk set in by 4 p.m., the fighting continued unabated with junior officers stepping up and leading charges, even as the Prussian forces appeared to be on the brink of defeat. It seemed that all was lost for Frederick's troops, with the Prussian right suffering a devastating cavalry charge, resulting in the swift destruction of four battalions and the capture of thousands of prisoners. Dorn was already dispatching a courier to Vienna to inform them of his hard-won victory, but fate had other plans. On the Prussian right, part of Holstein's cavalry charged full speed ahead, crashing into the unsuspecting Austrian infantry. Three regiments quickly surrendered, while others fled in disarray, their officers desperately trying to rally their men. Meanwhile, Zieten had been biding his time, delaying his attack until 4 p.m. for reasons unknown. When he finally gave the order to charge, it was from a position much further west than originally planned. As close combat ensued, with Austrian infantry firing point-blank volleys against Zieten's forces, amidst the chaos of the battlefield, an opportunity arose on the far right, where Holstein's cavalry launched a ferocious attack against the Austrian forces, closing in like a nutcracker on their far end from the north. The battle had raged on for hours, and central command had broken down with Dorn himself wounded and forced to leave the field. Battalions charged and withdrew on their own accord, and the dead and wounded lay scattered everywhere. 
As dusk settled in, Bulsen, himself injured but still fighting, led one final charge alongside Zieten's fresh cavalry. Together, they pushed the Austrians back onto the plateau, causing them to retreat in disarray. The infantry broke, and Prussian hussars chased the fleeing soldiers into the darkness of the night. The Austrians were forced to retreat towards the Elbe, defeated and demoralized. This hard-fought victory had come at a great cost to the Prussian army. Frederick, initially underestimating his losses, would later come to realize the true extent of the carnage. Official figures would later reveal that between 17,000 and 24,000 Prussian soldiers had been killed, wounded, or taken prisoner, with some estimates suggesting that the losses could be as high as half of the Prussian army's total strength. Despite this, Frederick forbade his subordinates from publicizing the excessive losses, and the surviving regiments were barely able to muster a battalion. The Austrians, too, had suffered greatly in the battle. Some estimates suggest that they had lost between 16,000 and 21,000 soldiers, with at least 7,000 taken prisoner, and the remainder either dead or wounded. They had lost 31 flags and 50 guns, and all those who were able to walk had fled the field. It had been a brutal and bloody affair, but in the end, the Prussians had emerged victorious. In truth, this is a wretched prospect and a poor reward for all the exhaustion and colossal effort which this campaign has cost us. The Battle of Torgau raged fiercely, but though it ended with a victory, it was far from decisive. The Austrians remained unbroken, while the Prussians paid a heavy toll. Yet the triumph secured Dorn's retreat from Saxony and Silesia, and in that regard Frederick considered it a moral victory. Nevertheless, the cost of this feat remained shrouded in mystery, as adjutants were forbidden from disclosing the number of casualties. The timing of the two-pronged attack was deemed abysmal by some, yet with poor communication lines and in the heat of the battle, it is doubtful that a better outcome could have been achieved. Some of Frederick's subordinates and historians saw the battle as futile, given that winter was fast approaching and the campaigning season was drawing to a close. However, others believed that the Battle of Torgo was the turning point of the war, mainly due to mutual exhaustion and depletion of resources. As mentioned, Frederick's primary goal was to force the Austrians away from Saxony and Silesia for the winter, and though the battle secured some ground, Daun still held Dresden, the capital of Saxony. Despite Frederick's hope, that the enemy would abandon the city, this did not come to pass. The Prussians were quartered in Saxony and Silesia after a gruelling year of war. On a cold December day, Frederick arrived in Leipzig, marking the end of a year of bloodshed and chaos. But as the new year dawned, Frederick was faced with a daunting reality. The upcoming campaign would require him to defend his kingdom with all his might. While the previous year had gone better than expected, his resources were dwindling, and the looming threat of his enemy's overwhelming numbers was a constant reminder of the relentless challenges ahead. The winter months were bleak for Frederick and his loyal followers. He was fraught with uncertainty about the future of his kingdom, his army, and his own health. But the Prussian leader refused to give up. He ordered his officers to recruit farmers and train them to become soldiers, determined to fight until the bitter end. The Austrians, French and Russians were also struggling with monetary problems, and it seemed that war fatigue was starting to set in for many commanders. Frederick and his kingdom were holding on by the skin of their teeth, unsure if they could survive another year of intense warfare. The fate of Prussia hung in the balance, Thank you very much for watching this video. Please leave a like, it really helps out the channel. If there is a topic, battle or person you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 per month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe.
See you next time.